offerings. And with that, let's get right to the Word of God. Looking forward to what the Lord has for us today. We have a very interesting uh, portion of Scripture before us. On Sunday mornings, we're going through 1 Corinthians chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And today our text will be chapter 14, verses 33 through 35. I'll have you stand if you're able. You can follow along as I read. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, beginning in verse 33, says, For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregation of the Lord's people. Women, verse 34, (laughs) should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. (laughs) If they want, verse 35, to inquire about something, They should ask their own husbands at home. (laughs) For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Okay. Pretty self-explanatory, right? Can we just close in prayer? Go right to the... No? (laughs) Nice try, right? Let's pray. (laughs) Lord, thank you for your word. And thank you for this portion that we have here open before us in your word today. Lord, we want to posture ourselves before you with open hearts and open ears and open eyes that we might hear and heed that which you would desire to minister to us in our time together in your word today. Lord, would you speak very clearly in and through this passage and give us understanding, Lord, into this, at first read, seemingly difficult passage to understand. So, Lord, thank you. Please bless our time together in your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So, today's teaching will be part three of a series I've titled, What the Church Should Be Like. Up to this point, the Apostle Paul has been answering questions that the Corinthian Christians had written him about in a letter that was sent to him previously, uh, actually from about chapter 7 on through the rest of this first epistle. He's actually answering those questions that they had uh, written him about. We don't have a record of what those questions were, but from Paul's answers here, we, for the most part, can conclude uh, what the questions were about. It seems that many of the questions were pretty basic about church, uh, the basics of the church as a whole, how to do church and what the church is to be like and what the church should look like. And so basic questions about the church. In chapter 7, Paul answers their questions about marriage and the issues related to being single, divorced, and even widowed. In chapter 8, he answers their questions about meat offered to idols and the issues related to whether or not they should eat from that particular meat. In chapter 9, he answers their questions about his rights as an apostle. He actually addresses the issue of finances. And he also uh, concludes that chapter by talking about running the race as to uh, receive the prize with our eyes on the prize. In chapter 10, he then answers their questions about the freedom that Christians have in Christ so long as it doesn't stumble anyone. And again, these were all very serious issues that were causing serious problems there in that church at that time. In chapter 11, he answers her questions about (laughs) women's head coverings, uh, the length of hair. Uh, Again, this was a a cultural dynamic at that time. And he also, in chapter 11, addresses uh, the communion table. Uh, They were um, turning the communion table into a drunken, uh, you know, gluttonous, (laughs) 
uh, party <laughs> and, and feast, and some people were going hungry, and they were partaking uh, of the communion table unworthily, and it's quite a scathing rebuke, really, in chapter 11. But clearly, again, they had asked Paul about these issues they were having uh, concerning the communion. In chapter 12, he answers their questions about the spiritual gifts, which they were apparently very uninformed about, really even ignorant about. In chapter 13, he continues answering their questions about the gifts, but the purpose of that famous love chapter is to shift their focus from the gifts of the Spirit to the really the fruit of the Spirit, singular, the most excellent way of love, the fruit of love. Then here in chapter 14, he is answering their questions about both the church worship service specifically and then broadly the church as a whole. As we near now the end of the chapter, it seems that Paul has turned a corner of sorts in order to address how it is and really what it is that the church should be, what the church should be like. In verses 21 through 25, he says, in effect, that the church should be a place where we worship God and nothing should distract from that. I want to, uh, before we go any further, uh, sort of take a step back and, and kind of give you a, a picture of what this would have been like for them then. It's important to understand that when Paul wrote this letter and they there in Corinth received this letter, it was read from the pulpit, much like what we're doing here today. Now, can you imagine being in church that day when this letter was read? I'm sure it was announced. They had it in their bulletin. They put it on their web page, I'm sure. Uh, this Sunday, the Apostle Paul's letter answering our questions. Oh, we got to go. He's going to talk about all the things we're, we're wondering about. He's going to address all the problems we're having. And we've got a lot of problems in this church. Keep in mind that Paul spent a year and a half there in Corinth. He knows these people personally. I, I would suggest that he led many of them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So if you can imagine that they're hearing this letter read as Paul is now addressing the issues that they had written him about. Well, here, Paul, in quoting Isaiah, says that it's really only the prophetic word that causes people to be convicted of sin and ultimately fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Now, the problem was that in that church, they were all speaking in unknown tongues when the whole church would gather together. And as such, visitors, Paul says, are going to think that when they see you doing that, <laughs> that you're out of your minds. So he's talking about nothing hindering the worship of God that should take place at church. Well, this brought us to the second one in verses 26 through 29, which is that the church should also be a place where we as believers are built up and equipped. Here Paul says that when they come together, <coughs> pardon me, as a church, everything they do, whether they have a hymn, word of instruction, revelation, tongue, or interpretation of the tongue, everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Then, in verses 30 through 32, Paul continues by giving specific instructions regarding tongues and prophecy, which, again, was being exercised and manifested in a very disorderly way, so much so that it was thwarting uh, the purpose of their gathering together as a church, their assembling together as a church. And it was thwarting people from worshiping God, from being built up in the Lord, equipped in the Lord. And here, uh, it was also keeping them from being instructed and encouraged. Well, that brings us to our 
text today, which, please note, was a very difficult uh, passage of Scripture to deal with uh, concerning uh, women in church. Well, in verses 33 through 35, uh, <laughs> just bear with me on this and be gracious to me on this, okay? I told my wife, I said, honey, <laughs> pray for me. Pray for She's going to be here second service in the back like this. Let's see how you do this one. Let's see how you handle the text on this one, honey. <laughs> we'll talk about this when you get home, dear. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Well, it's not actually that bad, I hope. Uh, we'll see. The church should be a place where we find peace and harmony. Again, when you understand the broader context in which Paul is writing them, you'll understand that Paul is wanting for nothing to get in the way of what they're to have happen when they're together at church. And apparently, something was going on on the part of the women that was causing problems in the church. And this is why Paul is addressing it. He says in verse 33 that God is not a God of disorder, which means that there was disorder in the church. He says, God is a God of peace. And this is the way it's supposed to be in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Well, apparently it wasn't that way at the, in the congregation of the Lord's people there in Corinth. In verse 34, he says, women should be silent in church and not allowed to speak, but they're to be in submission, as the law says. Husbands, do not elbow your wives right now. Verse 35, he says, and this is going to help, be very helpful for us in understanding what he's saying here. He says, if the women want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, not in the church. And he says that, here's why, it's a disgrace for women to speak in the church. Okay. This is one of those places in God's Word where it is extremely important to understand what I'll call the scriptural why behind the cultural what. And let me explain. Uh, we need to know a little bit about the culture of Corinth back in that day, very different than our day. And I think by doing that, we'll better be able to understand what it is that Paul is uh, saying to them. I think it'd be helpful to uh, paint a, a, a cultural canvas, if I can say it that way, with a broad brush so as to better understand the point of the passage, which, again, is that nothing should keep us from that which church should be for us. All of these things. Okay. First, the cultural norm in that day was to have the women seated on one side of the church and the men seated on the other. It's not like uh, today. Well, now that explains a lot, doesn't it? So if you were in attendance there at Corinth, the ushers would greet you, and they would seat you, and if you were a man, a married man, you're not going to get to sit with your wife, to which some of the wives may see, say, praise the Lord, I don't have to sit with my husband. Maybe the husband's saying, I won't, I won't get elbowed by my wife. Praise the Lord. I'll sit on this side. She's sitting on that side. So if I'm the pastor of the church of Corinth, I'm looking out at the congregation. I got men on one side. And I got women on the other side. Well, now this is going to make some, some sense here. The thought is that the early church adopted this seating arrangement because this is what they did in the Jewish synagogues. Many of these believers there in Corinth had come out of Judaism and this was sort of something that was culturally carried over into the early church, it appears, there in Corinth. Now, picture the, the setting here. As you might imagine, this would create some logistical issues, especially if and when the wife maybe had a question about the sermon. I know none of you ladies do that here, you know, praise the Lord. You're not, like, you know, interrupting the sermon. Honey, did pastor just say that? 
Maybe you do. <laughs> I don't see you. Don't worry. I also don't see you falling asleep. I have a lot of people ask me after. I'm so sorry, Pastor. You know, I, um, I kind of nodded off. and I'm like, I didn't even notice. And then they're like, oh, great. I just outed myself that I <laughs> nodded off. Um, it's not a problem. Listen, I understand. Every once in a while, I'll scream. I'll wake you up. Don't worry. It's fine. Um, it would be a problem if I nodded off. That, then that's a problem. So... <laughs> No worries. And by the way, you know how yawning is contagious? I would just simply and humbly ask, don't yawn, because I don't want to yawn in the middle of my teaching. I think it sends the totally wrong message. <laughs> anyway, back to our sermon, already in progress. Now, picture the, the setting here. You've got a wife who is sitting on one side of the church, and you've got the husband sitting on the other side of the church, and they're not necessarily close in proximity one to the other. And the wife has a question about something that was said, and she yells out to her husband in the middle of the sermon, Hey, honey! <laughs> what, what did he say? That's what was happening. And they were doing that during the sermon. You know, I, I was trying to think, I was, well, not think, I was praying, God, how am I supposed to teach this passage? And one of the things that uh, he, he kind of ministered to me was, uh, you know, and, and, some, and nothing wrong with this. Again, everything has to be done decently and in order. But, you know, and I appreciate this church, there's not a lot of people yelling, Amen! Preach it, brother! That is really distracting. That is really disruptive. And it doesn't take much for me. And I, I'm sure I could be diagnosed with all these conditions that they have nowadays. I'm sure as a kid they would have, they would have probably institutionalized me as a kid. But I mean, I, I, it, it doesn't take much for me to you know, lose track of where I'm at. I don't even need you to say amen for that to happen. So... But, it, but here's the other thing that it, that, that it does. It draws the attention to you. If someone's constantly saying, Preach it, brother! Everybody's looking like, Who said that? Who said that? We had a, this is a long time ago, in a land far, far away. Again, I only use illustrations from the church I pastored on the mainland. Uh, we had a guy that was like that. I mean, just, he would always sit right in the front row, and he would always yell out during the, teaching, Amen! Preach it, brother! Amen! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! He raised his hands, and finally, I just, you know, I, I tried to, you know, catch the attention of one of my ushers uh, who was sleeping in the back during my sermon, and <laughs> so, and I, I didn't want to have to deal with it in the, that doesn't happen here. That, that, again, this is on the mainland. So I, I wanted to, you know, try to very graciously and so I just, I, I said to him, I said, hey, brother, I really appreciate your, you know, exuberance and your enthusiasm, praise the Lord, but um, uh, I, I'm getting really distracted by, you know, you doing that, and I, I, you know, I just need to stay on message here, and can, can we talk after, and you and I can jump up and down and raise our hands and shout and scream and do whatever we want, but I just need you to not do that so I don't lose my place here, because I was... Uh, I thought, preaching a pretty good sermon uh, up to this point. And uh, he uh, kept doing it. So anyway, we laid hands on him afterwards, and uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding, sort of. But anyway, but this is what was happening there in the church. It was so disruptive because it was taking place during the sermon. And it appears that it was predominantly on the part of the women. Now, I believe that it's for this reason that Paul tells them to remain silent in the church. There needs to be this reverent order. That doesn't mean that we're to be the frozen chosen, as someone called it, <laughs> but there needs to be an order and there needs to be silence and reverence, really. And he's basically forbidding them to speak during church as they were. And it would also stand to reason that not only were they speaking and interrupting the sermon, but they were also uh, speaking in tongues and maybe even prophesying from across the room. And so Paul is saying, stop doing that. 
you want to do that? Wait till you get home. And he instructs them to not only wait till they get home, but he says to the, to the women, you ask your own husbands about that at home, not during <laughs> the sermon. Now, here's the question. Why does Paul specifically say not only are they to wait until they get home, but they're to ask their own husbands at home? Here's a thought. The thought is that the women may have been asking other men in leadership within the church instead of their husbands, which in that culture, again, this is where the cultural dynamics are so very important, would have been highly inappropriate. Even in the Middle East today, it is very inappropriate for a uh, woman to speak to another man who is not her husband. I remember when we were in Israel, this is 1994, and my wife and I, this is BC, not before Christ, this is before children, <laughs> when we could go together and travel. And so we're in the old city, and I'm negotiating uh, for a pair of beautiful camel leather sandals uh, for my wife and some friends of ours that were uh, in the group with us. And I was speaking in Arabic to the uh, Arab man in my native tongue, negotiating with him. And you have to understand that if you don't negotiate with an Arab, they lose total respect for you. You know, that if, if, if you are an American tourist, you are a stupid American tourist, we, <laughs> you, you pay the first price that they give you, that, they'll gladly take it. But they, it's, I don't know what it is, but the Arabs, just really enjoy um, negotiating intensely, very intensely. <laughs> and we're screaming at each other, and I'm telling him, shame on you for asking such an exorbitant price, to which he would respond, shame on you for trying to get my price so low that I cannot eat and feed my family. What is the matter with you? <laughs> and. So finally, I just said, you know what? Forget it. I don't want your camel leather sandals. I'm not going to pay that price. I started to walk out. And he throws the sandals at me. And he rips the money out of my hands. <laughs> it was pretty intense. By this time, we had the entire old city of Jerusalem gathered around to watch this spectacle. And he turns to my wife which was a complete diss. I mean, this is the ultimate diss for an Arab to talk to another Arab man's wife. He turns to my wife and he says in his English accent, Your husband is a hard man. If I were married to him, I would kill myself. I would cut off my head. I would slit my throat from one side to the other. We took those sandals and ran as fast as we could, as far as we could, to get away from there. He, he got me in the end. That was the ultimate diss, because he, he didn't look, he said that to my wife. Oh. Well now, back to our, again, sermon already. And How am I doing, by the way, with this difficult passage? Are we okay? Everybody all right? Okay, good. Praise the Lord. Um, this is what was happening there. They were going to, well, wait a minute, pastor. My, my husband isn't a Christian. Ask him anyway. How do you know? That by asking him, you're showing respect to him. You're honoring him as your husband. But he's not a believer. Yeah, but perfect. Ask him a question about scripture, and then he's got to search the scripture for the answer. How many husbands have come to Christ that way? I, well, I'm, I'm the man of my house. You know, my wife asks me the questions. I don't know the answer, but I'll find the answer. Right? And that's what Paul is saying here. You see, what was happening is they were shaming and disgracing their husbands by asking another man about their questions. And this is why Paul says in verse 35, it's a disgrace. 
This is, this is disrespectful. It's disgraceful what you're doing. Now, there are two reasons I believe that this is what Paul is saying to them. He's not saying women cannot speak at all in the church. Okay, I'll, I'll get back to that in just a moment. There's two reasons I believe that he's talking to the women about what they were doing. And the first reason is because of the word that Paul uses in the original language of the New Testament Greek. This word is laleo, the word for speak in the church. Women do not laleo in the church. Now, what does that word mean? It doesn't just mean speak as it's translated in our, in our Bibles, but it can also mean, you ready for this? Chatter. Oh, <laughs> chatter. It can also carry with it the idea of talking, questioning, and get this, even arguing. Oh, now I get it. There was contentions in the church. There were arguments taking place. There was chatter taking place on the part of the women. Yeah, the women. <laughs> now, the second reason I believe that this is not referring to Paul saying women cannot speak in the church at all is because of chapter 11, where Paul instructs women concerning the covering of their heads while they're praying or prophesying in the church. In other words, it's not that women are not to speak at church, Rather, it's that women are not to create problems or conflict by disrupting the church. That's what Paul is saying here. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I want to read verses 8 through 15. This is going to answer a commonly asked question about the woman's role within a church body. The question is often asked, can women be pastors of a church? The answer is no. And the reason it's no is because of 1 Timothy 2. Uh, wait a minute, Pastor. Uh, there are many churches on this island that have women pastors. And sometimes you'll have the husband and the wife who are both considered to be the pastors, co-pastors. Okay, it's not biblical. Women are not to be pastors of a church. Listen to what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, therefore, I want the men everywhere. You know, sometimes the men need to step up to the plate. And when you have women seeking positions of leadership, sometimes it's because of the absence of men taking their responsibility to be leaders. This is what happens in a home. This is common in a marriage. Sometimes the woman has no choice but to take that place of leadership in the home because the man has abdicated his responsibility. That's another topic for another time, man, and maybe we need to talk about this without the women here, uh, right? Yeah? Okay. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also, and this is important, want the women to dress modestly. Stop right there. Ladies, listen. Parenthetically, I have to say to you that men can be very easily distracted. We have to, especially in Hawaii, we have to be so careful with how we dress. It doesn't take much. And again, when we're at church, we don't want anything to distract us or disrupt us from what we're here for to worship God, to be edified, built up, equipped, encouraged, instructed. This is to be a place of peace and harmony. My goodness, we get it all week from the world. <laughs> we got to be able to come to church and, and have church be a sanctuary. We were talking about this in prayer, that this is a sanctuary. The church needs to be a safe place. It needs to be that one place we can go to worship God, to put everything aside, all the cares and the affairs of this life, 
and the distractions of this fallen world of which there are many so that we can worship the Lord and be edified and equipped and built up. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes. Nothing wrong with that, ladies. But when the intent is to draw attention to yourself, you're in effect drawing the attention away from the Lord by doing that. And that's the point of the passage, isn't it? What, what Paul is wanting to communicate to them is, Corinthians, nothing should distract you when you're at church. Women speaking up, questioning, arguing, chattering, disrupting, women not appropriately dressed, none of these things should ever get in the way of what we're there. Listen to what he says, verse 10, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to, here it is, worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. That verse 12, 1 Timothy 2, ladies, is why you cannot pastor a church. It's unbiblical. You cannot be in a position of authority over a man. Can you lead the children's ministry? Absolutely. Can you lead a women's ministry? Absolutely. Can you lead a prayer ministry? Absolutely. Can you lead a benevolence ministry, a homeless ministry? Absolutely. All of the above. But the one thing you cannot do is be in a position of authority over a man. Now, he's going to explain why. Verse 13, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. And there's that propriety word again. Well, I would suggest that for the women to be doing what they were doing in the church of Corinth was the source, not just a source, but I, w I believe it was the source of much conflict and disorder in the church. If you were to ask me what I thought was one of Satan's most successful strategies in destroying a church, this would have to be at the top of the list. More specifically, that of creating confusion. Who's the author of confusion? chaos, conflict. This is the strategy of the enemy. And he'll try to do it from without and from within. And it's particularly dangerous from within a church body. If Satan can get a church fighting each other, he can just take the rest of the day off and sit back as we just basically do his work for him. And he's very good at it. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, said, don't be ignorant. Don't be so ignorant when it comes to the strategies of the devil. Satan's devices, the wiles of the devil, some translations render it. Well, I want to close by simply saying, which sadly, by the way, very few pastors can say, and that is that I praise God for this church. I say it all the time, I hope you don't tire of me saying it, but I deem it such a profound privilege to be the pastor of such a harmonious and loving church. Again, sadly, very few pastors can, can say that. However, and there is a however here, <laughs> it would be most naive for us to think that the enemy isn't going to keep trying to bring conflict into our loving and harmonious church. One of the things the Lord has been ministering to me is that when we get into the new building, Lord willing, should the Lord tarry, 
that because the enemy is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, that it is incumbent upon us to remain steadfast in prayer now, during the renovation, and especially then when we occupy our new church building. Make no mistake about it. Satan hates this church, and he hates you. He really hates you. He really hates me, but he hates you too. And he does not want us out there. That's his turf. He does not want us, this church, you, me, to be out there because he knows that we're taking ground from the kingdom of darkness. And that arouses the anger of the enemy. I cannot even begin to tell you already the warfare that we've experienced. That's not the, my intent or purpose now. But I cannot even begin to tell you the amount of spiritual warfare and spiritual attack ever since we, even before trying to buy that building, and then once we closed on that building and tried to get a permit to renovate that building, <laughs> And all of the things that the enemy has been throwing at us. And one example, real quick. Uh, last week, someone at 6.30 in the morning, when Eric was on the side of the building and Leitu had just left for just a minute, someone drove in and stole an $850 generator that we had right there. The audacity. You know, I, I pray for those people. <clears throat> Not the way you might think. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> they stole your generator, God. <laughs> Get them. Okay, that's not very loving, but... And that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. So now we have another generator. It would take six guys to pick this thing up and, and steal the thing. The other one was a smaller one. Um, the audacity to do something like that. We're getting ready to sandblast the outside. We're going to, you know, do the exterior painting. And I, I know for a fact that there's going to be somebody that's going to try to tag it and, and do graffiti. I mean, it's just one thing after the other. I, I made the comment today in our prayer meeting that uh, actually... <laughs> When the enemy leaves you alone, that's when you, when you really need to worry. When the enemy is not attacking you, uh, if the enemy sends you a thank you card, pretty good indication that you're not a threat to the powers of darkness. It's when the enemy deems you a threat that he attacks you. So that's actually a good thing. It means you're doing the right thing. You're on the right track. Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you so much for this loving church. Please protect us, Lord, from the enemy. Please do not allow him to get a foothold into this church and wreak havoc. Please, Lord, protect us from biting and devouring one another, backbiting, gossiping, Lord, protect us from all that the enemy would throw at us. And thank you, Lord, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. In Jesus' name, amen.